Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's music still on. Good evening. Welcome everybody to this the third webinar in the Earth Odyssey series. The previous two webinars, the first webinar was on people, second was on nature, and this third webinar we bring the equation together of people, harmony, nature, peace and sustainability. But let me begin by celebrating the fact that we have perfect gender balance today in our webinar. <laughs> but uh, gentlemen, don't smile too much. Uh, this is assuming Dipali is going to come in shortly. Gentlemen, do not smile too much because we have at least three lawyers on, on board. One working on nature, another working on peace, and another working on well-being and spirituality. I want to begin by also playing, paying tribute to Switzerland. That nation, as we speak this minute, are voting about abuses against nature. I've been following up on the story. I've had some friends who have called, we have discussed. Uh, Nestle's and the big corporation in Switzerland headquartered there are against. Government is leaning towards them. But that is a very good grassroot movement. And it is possible that we will have the good news late tonight or tomorrow because it's electronic voting. So that will be very important to celebrate this small nation with a big heart. And they've done this in a lot of areas over the, over the last decade or so. So it's a tribute to them. I also want to interact here to say what is the core mission of Earth Odyssey? Why are we inviting the people like today, which is a wonderful diverse group? The core mission of Earth Odyssey is to inspire the 80% of the world's people who are at the forefront of the battle of sustainability and every challenge that we are facing. The other 20% are the professionals, the government, the scientists, the uh, change makers, the head leaders of civil society. And we are talking with each other and we are planning and we are formulating, but we forget the citizens of the world who have to be brought to the table. And in the final analysis, it's the citizen of the world who have the power of the thumb to vote and the power of the wallet to spend and being pressure on governments and business for real change. So it's very important that this is our mission. And every time we work with any of you who are experts in your own area, we would like your help. We want to work with you to see how can we bring in the youth, the women who are excluded to the table of decision maker. And remember the youth of today, nourished by their mothers, are the leaders of tomorrow. And they have to be trained as action oriented. So this, this is our mission in Earth Odyssey. And that's why we bring all of the experts like you on board and we complement with that aim. Let me also say that in this series of seminars we have, we are looking for which subjects we should focus on because we cannot do the whole range. I have spent 50 years working on sustainable development since 1971. In fact, since 1967, when I did my PhD thesis on the issue of how to deal with big systems. So sustainability is very vast and the expertise that you bring to the table, each one of you and the commitment that you bring is what will help us. So we have identified preliminary education, the school of life education to complement the school of the education we are following. Climate action, where nobody is talking about the need for every individual to adopt sustainable lifestyles with responsible consumption. We are looking at the symptoms outside the box. That's the second one. The, the whole issue of rights of nature, we've been talking for 20 years and there is no movement. IUCN adopts it, 
but there is no global movement to make it universal declaration. And I think congratulations to, to Giorgio's initiative that they are l at least producing the legal link to make this happen. That's, uh, that's where we are. Uh, so these are the areas on human wellness can be added to this because the whole thing, if humans are well, then they will individually go for sustainability because it threatens their own wellness. So this is the philosophy that we are trying to build up. So that's enough from me, just to give you, and we are very happy that please all of you are welcome to connect with us anytime and, and help us. We need your help in making this happen. So now I ask you, please look at your own screen and time yourself your six minutes. Uh, Luis, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mahendra, for the invitation and the whole uh, panelist. Uh, this is fantastic being here. I love the topic, of course, of sustainability. I was born in 1971, so <laughs> uh, we have already a connection there. Um, I would love to, to frame my, my six minutes around the concept of capitalism. Um, and I'm playing with words, of course, it's another ism. But basically what I want to send is a message that we see that new, new uh, organizational systems, new economic systems, new education systems, new health systems uh, are needed. And many of them are emerging in different communities. And I call, I call all these emerging systems a uh, capitalism when they are based on the fundamental right of happiness, on the fundamental philosophical focus on eudaimonia that uh, the Greek and Aristotle already brought to the table in a really wise way. So um, basically I represent the World Happiness Foundation. It's the largest platform in the world focus on happiness and well-being. And we are the stewards of two United Nations uh, resolutions. A one a focus on happiness and well-being and new as new paradigms of human progress, and the other one is uh, the one that established March 20th as International Day of Happiness. So, with that in mind, uh, our network of experts, influencers, um, activists are really working towards a world where uh, we can be free, conscious, and happy. And this is the focus of these four minutes that I have left, is the convergence of being free to be, conscious to expand and evolve, and happy to share. And this is very important because when we think about happiness, sometimes it sounds a bit fluffy, sometimes it sounds a bit superficial. It's one of those words that mean many things to many people. But for us, uh, it's not about being happy, it's about being happiness. When we embody and we embrace uh, the state of being where we can elevate the frequency, when we can elevate um, the vibration, we are connected to the nature, the energy of the whole system. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, we work towards uh, freedom. Uh, and in this case, it's the of freedom as well as the conditions around uh, building freedom, we, we work around consciousness. This is one of the key factors, very much related to education. Mahendra, you mentioned about education. The way we can really raise and make a fundamental impact in the world, uh, and we call it fundamental peace, is when we combine freedom with consciousness and happiness. But consciousness, the only way you, we can get into consciousness is through education is through education of the conscious part of what we understand and education about the subconscious part. And this is very important. And actually in this, um, in this uh, two minutes, I would love to share with you the framework that is um, on my book, which is called The Exponentials of Happiness. Uh, and and this is this is the new paradigm. How I, how I see the new paradigm emerging. So when we combine five elements, which is the element of chi or energy or fundamental life force with the element of nature, 
surrounding everything that exists, but then we understand that we can make an impact at the policy level, at the education level, at the personal growth level in three different uh, buckets, I think that we are wired to really go into fundamental change. And those are interconnected. And we know most things are interconnected. But when we understand that we can have an impact at the individual level by raising awareness, by getting mindfulness, by understanding transcendence, and this is a three-step process because we move from what is going on, why is happening, and what for. Those are the three stages. Then individually, we can really evolve and we can really expand. And there are and tools in order to do this. And these are the tools of working on empathy. These are the tools of working on forgiveness. These are the tools of working on compassion and love. So I see all empathy, forgiveness, compassion and love are tool, as tools for us to really evolve and move from awareness to transcendence. But actually we individuals through nature and energy are completely connected with the collective um, life on earth. And the collective is about humans, but it's about, it's about every living being. Um, and both the collective and individual are completely interconnected th uh, through a conscious level and a subconscious level. There is a collective consciousness and there is a collective subconsciousness. If we don't understand all those levels, then we are missing the big picture and we cannot impact a, a, and make a fundamental and sustainable change. And then between the individual and the collective, this is the challenge for humanity because communities are the ones that elevate, accelerate individual transformation or alienate us in many ways. And when I talk about communities, I talk about countries. I talk about families. I talk about clans. I talk about gangs. I, I talk about neighborhoods. I talk about schools. And they all have cultures, beliefs, and rules. Those communities are the ones that are helping human beings to thrive, or they are stopping us from growing. So when we combine these three levels, individual communities and collective, you will see the opportunity because here we have a whole plan. How do we impact on, at all three levels? And something that is definitely helping all of us to make fundamental change that was impossible pro probably 50 years ago is that now we are aware of the importance of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. We understand that observers change reality. So we don't have to do anything but, but becoming observers in many ways in order to make an impact on and shifting what the reality is. So this is this is very interesting because we didn't know that observers were able to make changes. And actually we are, and we know that through uh, quantum physics. Something very important, important as well, not, we understand that we are systems and we live in systems. And we understand that through system dynamics. And we understand the correlations, the feedback loops. So this is something very important to consider in order to make fundamental policy making change and get into 10 billion that we are going to be living in the planet by 2050. And the third element that is helping us to understand and make an impact is exponential technologies. So we are now very familiar with the word exponentiality because we see the COVID going up every day is multiplying. That's exponentiality. We live in a world of singularity and singularity means that we can reach out 10 billion by 2050 on anything if we really focus our energy there. Our focus at the World Happiness Foundation is to reach 10 billion by 2050, bringing freedom, consciousness, and happiness. And we can do that through understanding exponential technologies. So Thank you. All that Thank you. Framework, we know that we are uh, ready for new paradigms, and I call that paradigm capitalism. So I invite all of you to become a capitalist. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I'm sorry, your time is up, yeah, but uh, we will we will do that. And you have opened the door, and the most obvious person who should come to follow you is the word hope. So I want Keke Shan, please you follow with hope. Absolutely, thank you very much. And I am going to begin by sharing my screen. Okay. 
hopefully this works. Is my screen visible? Yes, it's coming. Yes, it is. Great. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Geheksha. I'm connecting with you from Toronto, Canada. I am the founder president of Green Hope Foundation, which is a United Nations environment program and UN Convention to Combat Desertification accredited social innovation enterprise whose mission is to empower all sections of civil society, especially young people and women from vulnerable communities using education for sustainable development as a transformative tool to provide them with the knowledge, skills, attitudes, values and behaviors required to think and act for a sustainable future. I am also a counselor of the World Future Council, a UN uh, Habitat Young City Champion, a member of World Humanitarian Forum's Youth Council, UN Human Rights Champion, winner of the International Children's Peace Prize, and the youngest recipient of Canada's Top 25 Women of Influence. So this mesmerizing picture of the setting sun was clicked in Suriname two years ago when Green Hope Foundation team was in Suriname at the invitation uh, from the president's office to engage its youth so that they could contribute towards conserving their nation's ecological resources and maintaining its position as the world's most forested country. But even this paradise on earth is now a threat as a consequence of the human footprint that's turning our forests into deserts, our rivers into sludge, and our cities into smog-shrouded spaces reminiscent of a sci-fi nightmare. And at the core of this environmental degradation lies a deep-rooted sense of human entitlement and apathy promoted and fostered by the drive for economic gains. So to strike at its root, we need to change mindsets, cutting across all sections of civil society. This needs to happen in our homes first and in our schools, where even in the most developed nations, environmental education is not a part of the curr curriculum. And it's this gap that we are addressing at Green Hope Foundation through our unique advocacy tool, Sustainability Academies, where children teach children about sustainability. And this peer-to-peer -peer engagement proves much more effective as opposed to just being told by adults. And we also take our message to those who are the farthest first, people and communities who are at the receiving end of this environmental degradation and those who are least responsible for it. People in refugee camps, migrant communities, children of prisoners and those in orphanages, marginalized women who have been victims of abuse, and majority of them have never been to school. They don't speak English, so we use art, music, dance, drama, and sports to teach them about stopping ecocide, about global warming, their rights as children and girls, about peace and the threat of nuclear weapons. And we believe that these voices that have so far remained muted will be the ones forcing our leaders to change when they start a de to demand a change in the status quo. And it's also these communities that have been hit hardest by COVID-19, losing their sources of income, having no access to healthcare and living in pitiable, congested, unhygienic conditions. So as a social innovation enterprise, we are working amongst these communities in Bangladesh, providing rations, masks, soaps, and sanitation education. We've launched a pilot project amongst the villagers who have lost their traditional sources of income, teaching them sustainable farming and poultry so that they become self-reliant based upon the principles of a circular and regenerative economy. And we've also been conducting 
awareness campaigns and ground level projects in Liberia to promote sustainable urban waste management strategies. So in an UNCTAD report issued last week, the pandemic has been termed as a crisis of uneven impacts and uneven responses. Not surprisingly, it finds that the pandemic's impact has been asymmetric and tilted towards the most vulnerable, both within and across countries, affecting disproportionately low-income households, migrants, informal workers, and women. Global poverty is on the rise for the first time since the 1998 Asian financial crisis. In 1990, the global poverty rate was 35.9%. By 2018, it had been curtailed to 8.6%, but has already inched up to 8.8% .8 this year and will likely rise throughout 2021. And that is a debilitation blow to the objectives of Agenda 2030, where the basis of prosperity and growth were built on the mission of overcoming poverty and creating a world where no one is left behind. So the roadmap for recovery requires an overdue and opportune shift in the structure of global trade and cooperation. And I will conclude by echoing what this report's key message uh, is, and that is COVID-19 has been painful and course altering, but it is also a catalyst for needed change. We need to reshape global production networks and reset multilateral cooperation for the better. And only then can we ensure harmony and peace between people and nature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kekeshan. Uh, can I now call on Eugen? Eugen, if you are ready, or Heiner, sure. one of the two. If so, please, you go ahead. Okay. And, I'm going to, and I'm going to ask Jojo to follow you to sandwich you with Heiner because you are both coming from two sides of that equation and she is the uh, the bridge. So Eugen and Jojo will be after. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mahendra. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Can Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, it was, I think, last Tuesday when uh, Mahendra brought in the matter that we need to change uh, today's education system and I've just heard something similar from Louis as well. It happened uh, that uh, I was working on something heading that direction as well from a somewhat different perspective. And the question that I'd asked was, what would Einstein, Newton, and Darwin do with all these matters you see here? Um, rather than uh, explaining that, this, I just want to share with you two short uh, parts of uh, this uh, video and then come uh, back on how we could use this. So you should hear it now, sir. So what we're going to do up. today is to ask Professor Michael Fitzgerald what Einstein, Newton, and Darwin would do if they were faced with the problems you see here. After the interview, we will provide three you can use to help people let go of thinking of the problems and to adapt to speech thinking, able to solve these problems. For those into this series, what we have here are the tough things like change, bureaucracy, hate, and the likes. A cloud of practices, procedures, and regulations prevents innovative solutions from the left side, solving the tough matters at the right side. Michael, you have researched geniuses, and Newton, Einstein, and Darwin in particular. Could you tell us what they would do about this situation? Well, the first thing they would do, they, they would look at what the current problems are and what current science says. And they, they, would, they would always be dissatisfied with current theories, current paradigms, current science. And then they would develop new theories, uh, new paradigms. 
and uh, they would use non-standard, for example, uh, Einstein, he, he used very much visual images uh, to, 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 to develop uh, to the, his theories. But what they... So interesting, isn't it? They would do something rather different than typically done today. Let me skip to another part of this. But we now look into how proof is obtained today. Isn't there a dominance of mathematics, which in turn makes it difficult to get proof for something like that, what Darwin did? Well, there is. Well, well mathematics, they do, they obviously they have a, they have a central rule, but, but there's massive replicate, non-replication in, in, in so-called scientific studies. I mean, a new paper showed that a study is more likely to be false than to be true. So they, 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 there are huge problems with statistics and huge problems with mathematics as well that, 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 that haven't been resolved. But the problem is if you take the very excessively linear, logical, uh, mathematical thinking to solve current problems, that will take you into a cul-de-sac. You, you, you have it, you have to deal with contradiction with they they have led us into cul de sacs proper model today uh, has has proved itself uh, to be very to be limited so um the way the video is available through YouTube, so you can have a look at the whole. What I'm go going to do now is skip into the summaries uh, we have created, and just to give you an idea as to uh, what the differences are between how they would approach uh, these big problems as to uh, versus how it is done today. I won't go into the details because of the six minutes, but one of the things uh, you see here is uh, if you look up the row with E equals MC squared, they all looked for all inclusive theories with simple rules. Uh, Einstein did it with mathematics, so did Newton, but Darwin wasn't in that position. So here we see something else. We see the use of patterns like natural selection and survival of the fittest. And when we then look into the practices uh, applied in science today and in organizations, it turns out they are pretty much the opposite of how Einstein, Newton, and Darwin uh, would go about it. Now, with them being being seen as uh, the most respected scientists, I would say here we have a huge opportunity to use this and get the uh, educational system adjusted so that also the Einstein, Newton, and Darwin approach. Uh, is used. Uh, look in particular here about here into the wet text where you should see the mouse. Um, proof is pretty much done through data mathematics and exact, exact log logic today, but what has kind of lost is when critical information cannot be expressed in data or process, processed through math and logic. So we have now huge research gaps. Uh, and uh, there's quite often the claim, it's not uh, the argument, it's not proven, uh, so it cannot work, but it, that's actually uh, incorrect. Now, uh, Michael Fitzgerald has also, I'm finishing up, has also uh, clearly said here, today's parad paradigms, practices and small have, have failed to solve these challenges. He has given a couple of rec recommendations to find them. And uh, now to my last slide, um, there's something we could all do right away and everybody can actually do. And here it is, pupils, students and professionals are trained to think and act within boundaries, models and paradigms. But then Einstein, Newton and Darwin are seen as the greatest scientists. They would always be dissatisfied with current theories, paradigms and science and 
they would develop new theor theories and new paradigms and use non-standard models. So what we can do is quite simple. We can ask and ask others to do the same, ask this question. Where is the complementary training of pupils, students, and professionals in the Einstein-Newton-Darwin approach? And with that, I would like to give it back to Mahendra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugen. Giorgio, you have the floor. Giorgio? Apologies, classic, uh, classic mistake there with uh, I forgetting to unmute myself. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, my name is Jojo Mata. I co-founded in 2017 um, the first international public campaign uh, to move forward a change in international law, uh, in criminal law. And that the idea is to criminalize mass damage and destruction of nature. In other words, ecocide. And this speaks to a different level to, for example, that that uh, Keke Shan was speaking about, where she was really looking at uh, educating at the grassroots level. Of course, we are always um, interested in educating at the grassroots level, but the impact of what we're working on is really looking at the very top level in the sense of policymakers, CEOs, government ministers, and so on, and looking at creating responsibility at that top level um, sort of the upstream side, if you like, um, for what is happening in the world today in terms of the climate and ecological crisis. So the word ecocide, uh, we used to mean mass damage and destruction of nature. And we see it as a root cause of where we're at globally in terms of this global crisis. So climate, climate change and biodiversity loss are essentially symptoms of something the cause of which when we look back in history is the mass destruction of nature destruction on a on a grand scale of ecosystems that has been going on for decades and committed by some of the world's biggest corporations and in large part because in most of the world it is actually permitted so you you can't go to a government and say i'd like a i'd like a permit to kill people for my new business you're not allowed to do that killing is a crime but you can go and get a permit to open a mine. You can get a permit to drill for oil. You can get permits and you don't even need permits for some of the activities that are creating the level of destruction we're now seeing of nature. And so there's a clear need to change the rules. And I'm echoing here the call of Greta Thunberg last year in terms of it's time to change the rules. So in our kind of in the globally dominant sort of Western culture and, and, and sort of legal paradigm, um, it is criminal law that is used to draw the moral line. It's used to draw the line between what is acceptable and not acceptable. But when we look at the laws and the rules that surround uh, nature and how we treat nature, most of those are in the arena of civil regulation. And there are actually a lot of civil cases. There are a lot of lawsuits going on around the world at the moment in regard to climate, for example. I mean, um, there are now well over a thousand live cases regarding uh, climate change and various corporate influence and exacerbation of climate change. And those cases are important. But the corporate response to civil litigation is essentially to change its budgeting. They see these kinds of cases as um, and these regulations as things to be worked around, complications to get around and, if necessary, to pay fines for. But there's no true deterrent and it's criminal law that's needed in order to create that deterrent. And that is because, you know, your, your average CEO doesn't want to be seen as a serious criminal alongside a war criminal or a genocidal maniac. Of course they don't, because... For a CEO, the way that they are perceived has a direct effect on their share price, has a direct effect on the success of their company and who wants to invest in them. And of course, if something's a crime, a bank can't finance it, an insurer cannot insure it, and a government cannot issue a permit for it. So you see that moving into the criminal sphere is very important. And how to do this? We aim particularly 
at the international level, at the International Criminal Court, aiming to place ecocide alongside genocide, alongside war crimes and crimes against humanity as one of the most serious crimes of concern to humanity as a whole, because that is the definition that is given to those crimes. They're also often called, for short, crimes against peace. And we believe that ecocide is already, in most people's minds, up there in that category. Because when we look at the consequences of mass damage and destruction of nature, when we look at what's happening across the world with more apocalyptic clarity all the time, fires, floods, droughts, polluted water, contaminated air, uh, depleting soils, we're seeing that actually the level of consequence for these actions is very much in the arena of the most serious crimes. It simply hasn't been listed as one yet. And there's a relatively straightforward process for doing that. Now, the ICC is a bit like the UN in that it's one state, one vote, which means that you to propose this change in the law, this amendment, it can be any country that does that. It doesn't have to be one of the big, the big uh, wealthy economies. Um, and it also has a set process to it. So you, it has to be proposed. It has to be admitted to for discussion. Then it has to be... Uh, discussed and adopted and finally ratified. And once that process is in place, once that process has been started, what we're looking at is a, is a kind of something that's coming over the horizon. And when CEOs and policymakers can see that coming, they can see that the practices will need to change. Criminal law is not retrospective. It will come in when it's brought in. And when it's brought in is, is the time that things will need to be changed by. So you want it to take a, a little while, but to, for people to be able to see it coming so that practices can change. And all of those leaders and all of those policymakers and those CEOs, they all know that drastic change is needed that in order to meet the Agenda 2030, in order to meet sustainable development goals. We're going to need to move faster than what than, than we're doing at the moment. There is there is something needed in order to accelerate that change. And creating this parameter, this, this legal parameter, this guardrail, if you like, can support all of those changes. It can support every single environmental campaign that's out there and, and has you know, fantastic traction, perhaps already, but is missing this foundation piece. But it can also create a guardrail for the bad actors to bring them back within a safe space of operation and for them to see that that's coming and know that that's something they need to move towards. And this campaign is gaining a lot of traction right now. And the whole concept and narrative around ecocide is gaining much traction. We're actually in the process of convening. We've actually just launched a panel of international, top international criminal lawyers from all around the world who are going to be drafting a workable, robust legal definition of ecocide at the request of parliamentarians that we're working with to actually place a definition a robust definition into that into that that uh, international government space so that governments can look at that and seriously consider taking that amendment forward and moreover because this this particular series of, of podcasts of webinars that you're doing is so is really focused on raising grassroots awareness it's important to point out that our campaign is very unusual in that it does recruit it does it does open itself to the grassroots, to civil support. We have an international petition on our website, stopecocide.earth. And what we know from being at this nexus, at this interface between a public campaign and public narrative and working directly with international criminal lawyers, with parliamentarians and diplomats, what we've seen very concretely is that where there is grassroots support, where there is civil support for this concept, the politicians also start to move. So there is a huge connection there and it's one that echoes what Kakashan was talking about, about those you know who, ha who don't necessarily have the, the voice at the top level but who can voice their concerns and create that pressure and so that's something that that our campaign particularly focuses on and it particularly focuses around this word this word ecocide because we believe it's very very powerful everybody can see that serious destruction is happening in various different arenas whether that's overfishing whether that's destruction of the seabeds whether that's deforestation of the amazon whether that's oil spills whether that's air pollution we can see we all of these things are um are understandable for people and this word this concept brings them all together and so the more we all talk about this concept 
the faster this law is going to move and be put into place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Jojo. Uh, Heiner, Heiner, you have the floor. Hello, I'm Heiner in Germany, in Berlin. Can you see my slides? Not yet. <laughs> It's a celebrating our diversity. So I'm fully with Jojo. We have given no voice to women, to kids, to animals, and to tradition, not to the people. And I think we call it flora and fauna, and we urgently have to do a mindset and rule set reset. So I'm fully into that. Can you see my slides now? Yes, go ahead. So you can see them? Yes. Perfect. So you see, I was just uh, in Stockholm, as um, Helena is speaking after me, to really bring the tradition, the languages together in the sense of Anna Lind. She spoke about deliberation and encounters. So we do this as makers for humanity, really getting the artists, the children, the youth, the whole civil civic society together and as i presented this this week here in stockholm i just want to give you the overview that we really see not this linear dualistic thing that i just do information and education or transforming politics but looking into engaging the people and maybe even in active protest and go not only in entrepreneurship and makers festivals, but looking into broader modes like the traditions have done, what they nowadays call systems and globe entrepreneurship. I presented last time that we need to bridge the SDGs, but the question is how? So how the traditions, and I recommend this Mother Pelican Journal, are taking in the wisdom of the people and I'm in Nicosia with the United Nations Democracy Fund looking into other ways of uh, moderation and deliberation and multi-track diplomacy and peacemaking. So you see this we did with Kofi Annan 20 years ago, dialogue among civilization. But the question is how? And that's why I selected this and I did last night to include, to put forward two women, La Donna and Jackie. And I came, uh, come to this after introducing the man who brought them together. This is Alexander Christakis, who looked into peacemaking and dialogic design. And he was in the 60s in the Club of Rome, where they looked into values and normative and participatory and not just prognostic futures. So you see all his work and whatever he did, I can show you with the World Council of Churches, a lot of hundreds of slides. But what I want to point out to you, that is his deep, but it's also very compassionate and feeling. And this uh, systematic people found La Donna Harris, I'm going to introduce. And La Donna Harris was uh, the speaker of North American Indian tribes and the right hand appointee of the president of America, telling as a chief of her tribe to look into peacemaking between the tribes and negotiating with the government in Washington. So I intro was introduced to La Donna 15 years ago at a systems uh, meeting conference, and she really empowered. So you see women, and she was working on recreating the circle of the American Indians, but also the thinking in dynamic spirals, like you find in Eastern conditions. So. I really feel, unfortunately, she is late. We, we cannot have her with her. But you see, this is a lifelong story of American Indians and Maori Indians tr uh, meeting them. And they came together through a, a lady who is unfortunately not with us here. She's presently in hospital. 
It's Jackie McLeod. Jackie, uh, Jacqueline Vasilevsky, she was in an independent education foundation between America and Japan. And if you see that she was in all this Irish, French, Cherokee, Swiss, Dutch, Gale, English environments, that she really looked into peacemaking and she organized um, circum Pacific uh, peace dialogues where the traditions and the countries go into the meanings. And that is a technology this Christakis developed with Doxiadis and Warfield and Hassan Özbekan. And all their thing is the four R's. What is the indigeneity, the alternative worldview of many, many traditions to look into values and relationship responsibilities, reciprocity and redistribution. And now even the North American Indians, the First Nations taking it up, moving it to the new internet age and including respect and relevance. And this is actually what I did and I hope I kept in time. Thank you very much, uh, Heiner. I want to ask for your uh, permission because this is a moment we all talk about indigenous people. We talk about our ancestors. So LaDonna is dead and Jacqueline is finally fighting the battle of life as we speak. So please just for 30 seconds, close your eyes and try to send our prayers to her, please. Thank you so much. Helena, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, I'm Helena Lindemark. Uh, I've been working with sustainable development uh, and work now very much with these uh, SDGs that I have behind me. Uh, and uh, I've been working with sustainability since 1991. And I would like to share a, or show a presentation. <laughs> In 2022, it's 50 years since the Stockholm Conference. We have a plan in the 2030 Agenda and the Climate Agreement, but we're moving way too slow. So it's really time for action. To contribute to all this, we arrange a series of dialogue meetings focusing on action now and co-creation between stakeholders from business, academia, civil society and the public sector. And we include youth, our future leaders, as key actors. It's also time to let go of the silos and find new new radical collaborations. Welcome to join us online or offline at upcoming events. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm Helena Lindemark, uh, and I've been working with sustainability since uh, 1991. At that time, I, I was at the United Nations in Bolivia for almost four years. Uh, and in 2014, when I started uh, Sustainable Development Sweden, uh, with the purpose to speed up sustainability based on the fact that Sweden is often seen as a role model with sustainability, I was looking for a bigger project to do just this. And uh, the reason why I uh, came up with this bigger project, the 2022 initiative, is that I found this book, right, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And I realized that it's from 1962. And I started to think, what actually happened between 1962 and 1992 when I got into this and we had the Rio conference? And I realized that in 1972, we had the first UN conference on sustainable development in Stockholm where I'm based. And the purpose was only one earth and we still only have one earth. So we need to take care of it, our home. 
Uh, already at the Stockholm conference, uh, Olof Palme, the Swedish prime minister, mentioned that we need a law to end ecocide that Jojo Meta was talking about earlier today. So we're 48 years later and we still don't have that law, so there's time for a change. Uh, and um, in 2015, the year after I started the company uh, and found this book, we had these two major agreements, the Sustainable Development Goals in the, in the 2030 Agenda and the Climate Agreement. Finally, we know where we want to be in 2030 and onwards. We have a plan. Uh, now it's 10 years to transform the future of humanity on planet Earth. So we are in a bit of a hurry. When, uh, a bit of a problem though with these long-term goals is that it's more or less easy for today's leaders to agree on these long-term goals because they're not going to be in power in 2030, most of them not at least. So to get action now, we need milestones. And 2022 is not only half, it's not only 50 years since the Stockholm Conference and 30 years since Rio, it's also halfway to 2030 since both those important agreements. And what we do during the next two years is crucial for the survival of humanity on this planet. Uh, so in June last year, uh, we proposed to the Swedish government to uh, host a UN conference in Stockholm and to add milestones to the 2030 agenda to, for accelerated action. And we also proposed that it should not only be a conference in Stockholm, but to have conferences all around the world that are connected digitally to be global. And Stockholm, Nairobi, and Rio should definitely be main nodes for this because we have the Stockholm Conference plus 50, uh, the formation of UN Environment Program uh, and all, uh, 50 years since that, and also 30 years since the Rio Conference. And if all the nations are supposed to reach the goals by 2030, countries like Sweden and others uh, should reach them earlier. So therefore we have this additional uh, milestone by 2026. And an important result from our side and for, the, for humanity, I would say, uh, is that in November last year, the Swedish government decided that they do want to host a high level UN conference in Stockholm. Uh, and, um, uh, synchronicity, I don't know, but five days uh, on our two-year birthday of the foundation, 2022 Initiative Foundation, we had an article uh, in a Swedish uh, magazine about this, oppor this opportunity. And uh, just five days later, uh, the Swedish government announced their plans. And now uh, it's, it's good that we will have a UN conference in 2022. That's great. But uh, just another UN conference will not make a difference. We need action and we need action now. So therefore we're uh, now uh, gathering people, well, people from different uh, kinds of actors to co-create sustainability and get into action now uh, and to leave no one behind. Uh, and we, the humans need we, the people, need to understand that nature is the basis for our society and for our economy, and that we are also part of nature. And if we ruin any of these uh, SDGs that are at the bottom of this uh, wedding cake of the Stockholm Resilience Center, then the society and the economy will fall apart. And that's what we're, get where we're getting now. Uh, and uh, we really need a new economic logic based on well-being and a compass for navigation towards uh, a place, uh, a safe place for humanity within the planetary boundaries. Uh, and we use this compass where the compass points have been changed from north, east, south, west to nature, education and economy, sustainable societies and well-being. And to show that we need to turn things around and that nature is the basis for our survival, we've turned the compass upside down. And if we look at the SDGs based on this compass, it's much easier to see what they're all about. It's easy to see that the ones that are at the bottom, those are uh, the basis for our survival on this planet. And the ones that are related to education, economy, innovation and lifestyle, and also uh, SDG 16, 
legislation can be used as tools for creating sustainable societies, the well-being of individuals, and for solving the damage that we've done to nature. And goal number 17, partnership for the goals, is crucial for us to reach these goals and for leaving no one behind. So uh, we're creating this multi-stakeholder platform for dialogue and co-creation. And this is our proposal for the arena for sustainability games in best for the world to be launched in 2022. And hopefully also this, this can be used for the UN conferences. Thank you. So I want to give the floor. Dipali has just sent me a message. She's uh, listening to all of us. And she says, since we appear to be short of time, so like a good lawyer, she wants to stand on the side and intervene when we have the discussion. Yukepeme, you have the floor. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, my name is Ukweme Okun. I am a lawyer and an ambassador for peace. We have consciences which guide the rightness or wrongness of our behaviors. I'll, I'll be focusing on two principles, morals and law. Morals consist of standards of uh, beliefs, values, and behaviors on what is right. Law comprises the set of rules that regulate the actions of people to protect citizens from abuses and provide for their general safety, among other things. There is a connection between law and morals because they regulate the conduct of individuals. As we advocate the respect and protection of human rights, we must advocate environmental justice. We cannot thrive in an unclean, unsafe, and unhealthy environment. We enjoy a symbiotic relationship with our environment. Our laws must re reflect our moralities. So we share, we must, individuals, communities, countries, and so on, we must share the responsibilities. And we all are affected by environmental justice. And so we must not allow our consciences to be tainted with divisiveness. I conclude with the words of Jane Goodall. We have the choice to use the gift of our life to make the world a better place or not to bother. Thank you. Uh, Mahindra, you're on mute. Yuri, if you can, uh, if you wish to make a statement and you can make it in four minutes, then we are totally on time. We have discipline in this webinar today. So please go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for being here, for participating with us. I just want to say that we are in the Earth Odyssey. We started this uh, foundation, we started this to make a movie, a documentary uh, to spread the word of we have to preserve the the planet, of course, for us and for everybody else, for all the races, all the species. And that's what we're doing now. We are preparing uh, a screenplay. We're preparing uh, a message that we can put in a in a documentary and send to the world. So that's our, our message. That's what we're trying to do for next year. We're going to be preparing. And of course, all these webinars, all the seminars, all your participation is helping us to define what the message will be. So it's just an invitation for everybody to continue with us and having this in mind that we're preparing this screenplay for a, a documentary movie that we will share with the world. So everybody's invited to, to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was given the responsibility, which I'm not often given, by my team to say, I need to be making notes on what everybody said and, and bring it together in the next 30 minutes of our discussion. So. The issues that uh, I start with, uh, uh, Luis, uh, we don't need to say anything more because that's happiness and joy is the goal of not only nature, but humanity as well. 
Kageshan, you talked about the pandemic and how it's affected uh, the poor and etc. I want to tell you that we are in deep trouble because this vaccine is not going to 80% of the world's population. The 20% are buying up all the vaccines and we don't know which vaccine will be available when. Three years from now, maybe they will be there across the world in the poorer countries. And as long as pockets of COVID-19 exist, and we don't know how effective is the vaccine, the world will have third and fourth waves and nobody is thinking. It's always, I want to be the first line. I'm the richest. I'm going to buy up the vaccine for my people. So please, this you need to build into your, your wonderful writing on the pandemic. So that's one of the points I wanted to make. The other point was, uh, Eugen, wonderful Einstein, Newton, and Darwin. What we forget, these were complex science, pure scientists who worked and gave answers that made a difference to humanity. Our scientists are sitting in ID in ivory towers and not doing the applied part, which is what we need. We need the science and technology in the service of humanity. It's not happening. So I think we need to learn from the Einstein, Newton, and uh, Darwin to see how we can apply it in the challenges. And those three people fundamentally, can you imagine if they had met and worked together where we would be in our world? So that's uh, one of the points I wanted to make. The other point is a uh, couple of people mentioned about women, compassion, empathy. 50% of the world's population is women. If you have a plant in your home, and if the lady of the house sings to that plant or talks to that plant, it will recover. And we know truthfully from nature that with compassion, empathy, altruism, uh, caring, you can heal. And the same implies in the human world. So when 50% of the population who have inherited, who have been naturally endowed with these elements, we are not bringing them to the table to heal the humanity which is divided and to stop the destruction of nature. And I think it's something to think about. Yes, the argument is very simple. Women are being empowered, so please don't start to mess around with this. The fact is 80% of the people cannot sit with their men, men partners and have a, have a dinner with them. It's not allowed. And we need to be aware that we are talking about the world. We are talking about the planet. We're not talking about pockets of population. So that's another second point. The other point I have, a uh, wonderful initiative uh, of Ecocide especially the legal side. And we have excellent lessons from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 in the aftermath of the horrible tragedy of the Second World War. In spirit and in content, it was meant to be legal binding, but nothing has happened. We may have had Rwanda, we may have had Cambodia, we may have had uh, former Yugoslavia, but it's very small. And it was meant to be that if your neighbor is hungry, you are responsible to make sure that he doesn't go hungry. It didn't happen. So again, when you target corporations, you target governments, remember that you need the eyes and the ears of the people on the floor to report to you that somebody is dumping this here in Nigeria or wherever it is. So please, please, the plead. And that's where we want to work with you. How can we take this message to the grassroots level? How can we have a global citizen campaign to force governments and business to agree to making a universal declaration of human of nature rights, which is the frame against which the crimes can be measured? So it is something to brainstorm. We cannot do it all, but I think we need to plant this these seeds of change. The last thing I had on the issue, of Helena of sustainable development goals. We were there when the Millennium Development Goals came, when Millennium Assessment came, interlinkages. When you have 17 goals, 
you have 289 interlinkages that nobody is talking about. We cannot handle 289 linkages which exist between 17 goals. And if we forget the linkages, you will have a nice result on poverty and hunger to say it went down by this percent. But the interlinkages will destroy and we won't achieve the targets. So this is a prior issue. And I congratulate Sweden that it wants to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Stockholm in 2022 that coincides with the mission of Earth Odyssey. We, over three years, want to tell the world, don't bury and don't forget Agenda 21, because that is the most complex, comprehensive program that was ever launched and never funded. We celebrated Rio plus five, Rio plus 10, Rio plus 15, Rio plus 20. Nobody's talking about Rio plus 30. And it's time to wake up the world because what Rio gave to the world, the principles of polluter pace, common but differential responsibility, precautionary principle, precautionary principle means we should have been wearing a mask and the world refused to do it. And there's no coordination, there's no global partnership. We are paying the price of this. Now, these are the issues that rise. And where Earth Odyssey wants to work is to how do we take it to the people? How do we bring the youth, the leaders of tomorrow, in the school of negotiation, in the school of life, that they come to the table prepared? And not me first, my country the first, the greatest, etc. We are going back to bilateralism, uh, unilateralism instead of multi. So with those words, we are 23 minutes into our discussion time. Wonderful. Thank you. The floor is now open for our discussion. And Yuri, I don't know what kind of uh, chats that you are getting, but uh, we need to respond to some of them, which we will certainly all respond in writing. But now we want you panel members, please thank you for your great input, but let's Come together now. Thank you. Heiner, you have the floor. I liked Eugen's presentation very much, but I would like to add another name, unfortunately not a woman. It was Takur Tagore, the first Asian getting the Nobel Prize and visiting Einstein and discussing with him only through music and mathematics. So we have to widen our ways of cultural expressions and, and sharing and negotiating. That is my first thing. It is very clear for me to what uh, Jojo said, that we have to include all living things and we have to give voice to any kind of the flora and fauna. And the last, we did in Cyprus uh, for the MDGs with the use of East Europe, more than 10 years ago, negotiations of the root causes, and all this is there. And when we, as the European Citizen Sciences Association, were looking into the blind spots, then the lady uh, in, in the office of the CBD, Convention of Biological Diversity in Montreal, said, we have so many gray areas where we have no data so we have to go to quality interlinkages, like Mahendra said, and, and really have to make sure that the citizens are not uh, the uh, appendix to do what is wrong in the scientific model. Thank you. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Heiner. I don't know how uh, you're, we've been in the same journey. But I want the rest of the panel to understand something which we didn't say. We're doing a series of these webinars. Our final round is going to be music events where we will have the musical world doing an event for women, another one doing for the youth, another for nature, etc. So the end point of Earth Odyssey is going to be to bring the youth, the peep, men and women of this world together in music events. In the past, we have done music event like We Are the World in support of the famine in Africa. We did one for Cambodia. We've done many. Those are after the fact. We need to preempt and bring the musical words. And I'm sure musicians out there 
love their partners and love their loved ones and they will come on board and and UK Peme has experience she's a musician herself so this is our aim for musical events and the link between Tagore and Einstein is very relevant thank you who is next please I can go next go ahead okay uh, so I would like to respond to Jojo so uh, as you said, I do work at the grassroots level and I completely agree that laws are extremely important. We, you and I are sitting here today because laws are on our side. We've, uh, we know our rights and that is what enables us to uh, keep going. But then what use are the laws if people don't know about them and if they don't help those in need? Because you have laws, but when you don't have food on your plate when you don't have safe spaces, when girls are being sold during COVID to feed the family, where are the laws? So what we need to create awareness about the laws and provide education to the people who are affected the most so that they know their rights and they know that they are protected by those laws. Because all countries have laws, but then you still have women who are raped on a daily basis. Women are being sold, girls are being sold. Uh, the, a very big factor in that is that they can't go and ask for protection because they don't even know that they are protected by those laws. So grassroots activism and top level work have to go hand in hand if we are truly to achieve a sustainable world. Another thing is that you can put forward a hundred laws, but it is the implementation on the ground that uh, is most important because who checks when they're implemented? Who ensures that the lawmakers themselves are not breaking the laws? I've seen that firsthand. I've seen a 13 year old girl in a refugee camp carrying her own baby. Where was the law then? So we really need to ensure that, you know, it's not about your work and my work. If we are to truly achieve a sustainable world, it's about our work. And here, young people play a very important role because you know, now there's this uh, very Western uh, thing of tokenizing young people as just uh, striking or protesting. But young people who are affected most on the ground, we are the ones who are uh, taking forward uh, the work and ensuring that and it's not just about striking and protesting, it's about actually creating change on the ground. And that's exactly what Green Hope does, bridging that gap between the top down and the bottom up processes. And Heiner, I'm so glad you brought up uh, Rabindranath Tagore because uh, he, as a musician and poet myself, he's been a huge inspiration uh, to me, especially since my grandparents are from the same uh, place as he was. And uh, his uh, words, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls has literally been uh, what has driven me and Green Hope Foundation to ensure that we really break down those walls and ensure that uh, we are able to have that cross-pollination of multidisciplinary dialogue, which is exactly what's happening here today. So, yeah. I, th I think we need fusion and we have the Tagora Einstein Council and Foundation in Chantinitiken and here in Berlin, mm -hmm. and I can help. Absolutely, yes. And Shanti Niketan is such an excellent example of uh, nature and environmental education and outdoor education where you are not restricted within those four walls, but you actually learn from nature. And given that uh, the theme of today's webinar is people, harmony, and nature, that is literally what Shanti Niketan embodies. So, yeah, thank you, Heiner, for bringing up uh, Tagore. Keke Shan, the most two important words you said which in fact we have often forget it's our work it's the work that we do together in all these areas and we need to remember that and that's why this panel so diverse as it is it's our work that can focus and contribute to all the problems we are talking about helena can i put you on the spot at the, this moment uh, we talked about interlinkages, but uh, can you, you, you did mention core values. 
as being critical. So can I give you the floor to say a few words on that? Yes, I, I need. I think we need to find our definitely core values and, and to find this inner compass for ourselves. Uh, and also we have the SDGs, there are many, just 17 and, and the, all the uh, targets and that. So we need to simplify that to just uh, understand what it's all about and the, this compass thinking and, and all these other things that you're working on can be used for that. And I also wanted to just uh, point out what you mentioned about uh, the Rio uh, plus 30. Uh, in my presentation, the, the, one of the slides didn't really work very well, So, but that was mentioned there that uh, 2022 will, will both be 50 years since the Stockholm Conference and, and 30 years since Rio, and also 50 years since the formation of UN Environment Programme. Uh, and I would also love to see how we could all collaborate around what we're working on to develop sustainability games, uh, a game in best for the world, not in the world. It would be a game where everyone will be a winner. Uh, and the plan is to launch it in 2022. And why not with your end music events and, and things you're planning, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> go, go. Since you raise your voice. You <laughs> yeah, have the sorry, floor. I realize. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm 100% with, with uh, KK Shan in terms of the working together. This is not about one thing or another. This is about very much, you know, working in, in all the different arenas as we are, you know, best placed and, and, and best uh, equipped to do um and i suppose for, you know for for what the the very one specific th piece that you know we we're, we're working on with stop ecocide is we feel very much is in is in support of all the other work that that is going on and the you know, the reason that we focus on that very specific specific thing is precisely for that reason it's not in any way intended to I exclude any other avenues i mean it, obviously it's impossible to enforce a law if the law isn't in place in the first place. So, you know, that's that's our particular particular focus. We, we're kind of a bit of a one trick pony, as we say in the UK, you know, we're, we're focusing on this very one specific thing. Um, and what, you know, our, obviously our ultimate aim is actually to be supporting all of the work that is going on um, from all of your different fields by having this little fan particular foundational piece in place. It's, it's in no way meant to be exclusive. And of course, uh, as I say, we also work with very much with expanding that conversation and simply having that conversation in every possible arena is actually one of the most powerful things that citizens can do is, is raise their voices. And, you know, Jojo, you are doing the work now, it's in the forefront. Human beings need nature. Nature does not need human beings. And your efforts to take care of nature through legality and other means is at the heart of the survival of humanity. Everything else is around that. So it is extremely important part, not only governments and business at the high level to c come on board with the legality issues. We need to mobilize and our future demands on the fact that we find a way to save nature. And I think it's interesting what you what you said at the beginning about how you know we, this is all uh, we, we are all connected. This is all we humans cannot exist without nature. But you know our our his, the history of the sort of dominant way of thinking is very separate. It tends to see you know nature as something that we can extract and use and 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 effectively the the reality of it is very different. The reality is that there is a complete interdependence there, um, and so you know that there are consequences when we damage nature and the consequences ultimately will be will be to us and you know the my own experience of over 50 years in the business and i didn't pay attention to the indigenous people and the knowledge of the indigenous what is happening in the amazon and elsewhere they have the secret of how to live with nature in harmony and that's why i asked you I felt from my heart that Jacqueline, 30 seconds to remember a person who is unknown in this world of development and sustainability and everything else, but a person that's prime mover. And we need to remember that. And everywhere the indigenous tribes are being 
killed off. In the richest country in the world, the richest country in the world today is Norway. And the Sami people there who live in Norway, Finland, and Sweden are under as much pressure as we have indigenous people in the Amazon and elsewhere. And here is the richest developed country, the same with the Aborigines. So that knowledge of the indigenous community is very crucial. Yeah, it is not scientific or it's not, can be, can, it's not being interpreted as scientific. And that's why I lead to the question, Eugen, I need to put you on the spot that all these three big names you mentioned were pure complex system science but they worked in the interest, their results were in the interest of humanity. And they were very humble, like Einstein said, I only found a few pebbles on the beach and there are millions of pebbles out there. So how can we, how can you take this pure simple scientist and bring this scientist in the ivory tower back on earth to make a difference to humanity because science means nothing when humanity is gone. So I want to please respond to that. Yeah, I think what I've tried today is, uh, should be a, a clear possibility. If you only ask this question, how can people resist on not doing, on doing the opposite? Or oh, no, let me rephrase it. Um, what we see, uh, what we see there, the approach Einstein, Newton, and Darwin would take are pretty much the opposite of how things are done today. We can see that now. People can see that they did things out of the box, and today. We have out-of-the-box solutions and all the big issues I've shown at the beginning, uh, out-of-the-box solutions of highest impact are available today. We just don't get them through the system anymore. So now we can say here, this is what Einstein, Newton, Darwin uh, would do. So let's now add this way, this approach into the educational system. And we can now ask very precisely also, how about the phenomena we have used, uh, we have seen being used to get the coronavirus under control? That's part of this, I'm thinking. To me, it's like, uh, it's how things are done today. And I've, I've asked that where, where is the integration of phenomena knowledge like exponential growth, capacity management into, in brain research? It wasn't there. To me, and this was part of my job, uh, these uh, three phenomena, in particular in data center computers, with capacity management. And to me, this is like doing mathematics without the basic calculus, without plus, minus, and division. So every scientist working with complex systems, doesn't matter in which field, you should understand the phenomena that may occur and the practices they provide. So that, that's two things that could be used. Now, a third one. Um, uh, Jan Rotmans here from Erasmus University has uh, made this statement. There is panic in boardrooms. People know, executives know that things need to be done differently, but they do not know how. Now, I've just shown you two possibilities, and there are countless more possibilities available to help them making the better decisions. So what we can do is create new, fresh possibilities that could be used, that they could use, that could help them. If they still don't do things, then it's time for criminal things, for criminal, for uh, lawyers and to, uh, follow the criminal part. So, yeah. Do you know what, it's so funny, I, I, would, I would actually say that potentially it's the other way around, because if you look at what unleashes people's creativity most quickly, its parameters. We had a we had a, a kind of a cookery program in the UK that was very very popular. It was called Ready Steady Cook, and you were given certain strange ingredients and a time limit, and you had to use the ingredients that were in front of you. In other words, that was your restriction, and you had to do it within a certain time, and you had to create the most delicious dish possible. So I believe firmly that when we put the right rule in place, we actually unleash the creativity because those, those CEOs and those thinkers and those companies then have to say, okay, in five years time, I'm gonna have to do what I do without destroying ecosystems. Let's put our thinking to how we do that. And then you're gonna see some really interesting movement. 
Well, uh, I really like yeah, it. I like also to... like what you what you said about root causes before, because another video of mine addresses that very very uh, thing. There are countless root causes. No, sorry, that's wrong. In today's thinking, there are too many root causes around to make a difference. But if you let go and simply ask the question, what are the most damaging root causes? It becomes manageable. And they can be fine. And some of them are in the in this other video. Now, if you put this together, and they really like your thought, that here, dear CEOs, here are, are possibilities you haven't seen yet, but you're looking for new things. And here we have a time frame by which you can implement them. And that, uh, that yes. highlights. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jorgen, that highlights the fact that we have too many interlinkages and you have to find out which ones out of the... Well, yeah, I thought about the discussion we had last time. Uh, uh, Mahantra and myself have spoken about these linkages before. Um, there was something uh, additional to that. Um, when I look into the linkages, that's all fine, but today's world uh, is so difficult that that's not only a matter of linkages anymore, but the damage is so huge. Uh, companies are fighting for survival. There are cost savings initiatives, that there are all sorts of secondary third level, level implications that we would need to consider as well. So the question here becomes, how can we get the job done without worrying it too much about all these linkages that are there. That brings me again back to where to the most damaging root causes and what are the highest impact solutions. Then we don't have to worry about hundreds or uh, uh, dependencies or so, or 10,000 or whatever they are. And we can simply go straight to the uh, uh, solutions that provide the highest impact at the lowest possible effort, cost, and risk. Let's, uh, we will come back to that point. I'm going to give the floor to Luis. Luis. Thank you. Yes, no, it's, uh, it's fascinating, the discussion that I, I want to, I don't want to oversimplify, but I really want to, uh, to focus on, and something that we need for innovation might be frameworks, but we really need to be relaxed. We really need to be unusing our happiness. So I think sometimes we try to over complicate things and, and the reality is that they are very simple. We have to go inside, we have to, we have to be good people. We have to use all our emotions and our happiness and our joy and to transform ourselves. That's it, that's all we have to do. The moment you do it, you are wired to do many more things. And, and you can only do that in nature, by the way. So something I would say that I would love to invite all of you to celebrate during the week of happiness, March 20th, because actually we do it in a really important way because we are in nature, we connect music, art, we, maximize the impact of the community and we do it by learning heart to heart. It's really experiential learning, is using all the senses and that's the way we can get to the 80% of the population because we might have researches on the ivory towers but uh, you know one paper is read by six people on average, all these papers. So if we want to get to 10 billion people by 2050, we really need to celebrate. Thank you. We really need to go inside. And we need to find the Thank you. Of Yuri Dipali is trying to come in. I don't know what the problem is. Uh, but following one, Luis, what you say, let's not go with the elite of this world who are now going to the Amazon for ayahuasca. So <laughs> let's find another way. Heiner, you have the floor. Yeah. Yes, I think, Luis, when I understand you right, it's a mixture between serendipity and flow. And uh, we have to see that the big composers, Mozart, Brahms, uh, open themselves through meditation from where, why, and where to, to be open to conceive such a piece, big piece of mu uh, music. You cannot just start with one puzzle and then another puzzle, and maybe that piece of the puzzle is from another uh, game. So. 
when we really look into Einstein and his unbounded creativity, he said on his deathbed, I read the Bernsteinsche Volksbücher, and maybe this is what the children of the world should read. It was a weekly magazine of open-ended, totally crazy stories every children got. And so they really, really open themselves and breath in and out. And I just read um, We Are Nature, I think, by John Paul in, in the sector here. This is right and that is wrong. There is natural sciences, there is life sciences, there is humanities, and we have to be concrete to really bring with the knowledge of the tradition, the order systems and the cosmologies together and not um, go away in all our perplexity because there are so many interlinkages. But uh, oh, I know... Maybe, maybe last, la just last word, I forgot. You see, I'm doing with others an international encyclopedia of systems and cybernetics, but we need more than systems. There's a general model theory, like a model you do in the sandbox in kindergarten. And when we don't come to a model like an artist, like an architect, then we are still stuck in our mode of alphanumerics and maybe some formulas. Okay. I, I just want to add that it's very simple to say, stop eating meat and the world's problems are over. Don't be so innocent. Don't be so simplistic. There is much more to this equation. So, you know, people make this statement, eat, stop eating meat and everything is okay. It isn't. The system is very complex. And I think, as Louis said, it is a complex system. But everybody has the same goal. Prosperity, progress, joy and happiness. We are all rational beings and we can do it together. And all these different disciplines, how can we make these bridges? And you see the diversity on our panel today. The balance is excellent, but the diversity and the ideas that are there. And I am, by training, a systems thinker. By analysis, I'm a system analyst. And by action, I'm a systemic actions. And that is what we need in every subject we are touching. We need to go back to the ability to think systematically to, and have systemic actions at the end of the day. And if systemic actions is what will make sure that the output has a better chance of succeeding than without this framework. So can you imagine we are absolutely on time, but the beauty of this uh, webinars, uh, the, the platform we are using, is it, it limits people to 10 people to speak. Chat lines are open. We will respond to those chats. And it allows for a little bit in-depth discussion. And I think it was a good idea. Thank you, some of the panel members, for uh, pointing out that, don't be crazy. Give us two to three minutes to make my statement. And uh, so thank you so much for that suggestion. And I think uh, I can say from my point of view and on behalf of Earth Odyssey, we are ready to work with each and every one of you. Yuri, as always, you have the last word, unless Dipali is online, but otherwise you have the last word. Well, I don't think she managed to uh, connect. She's in France, so she's having a problem with connection. Actually, I have to excuse myself. I, I also had some problems here connection in, in Brazil. I'm close to Sao Paulo, not in the jungle, not in the Amazon, but even though close to the capital is to have some some connections problems yeah i endorse everything you guys said it's uh, fantastic it's an uh, amazing um, panel we had today uh, i think like i said before we have to work together and i think uh, complementing what louis said um, we have to get the message out and the, the best way is not to write a paper maybe doing a movie and doing some events like you do i mean really making people celebrate uh, the joy of being alive and the joy to continue being alive and you know keep the plant for next generations so thank you very much for everybody to participate and we continue this uh, journey and we're going to be like i said preparing a screenplay so maybe next year we start thinking we start preparing this documentary we can make with our message together and really turn this into a very powerful uh, tool to spread the word okay thank you 
And if Dipali is, sorry, if Dipali is <laughs> listening, she is in the south of France where the internet should be really good. It's not a third world country, but she's unable to connect because it's poor connectivity this morning. Maybe it's a storm there. So thank you. The floor is open for all of you for the last word. Anybody? Okay, I just Jojo. want to. Um, Jojo. I just want oh. to note that the Pali was. Uh, she actually she connected here, but uh, she lost uh, her connection. So she was part of this panel, although briefly. So the balance. I just wanted to say thank you. And the balance was perfect. You. She was trying. Okay. So, yes, thank you so much. Thank and you, thank you. Thank you, Yuri, everybody. It was fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for each and one of you for only one reason. Thank you for being you because we need you in this framework. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye.